All right, welcome back. What we're going to see now is why you should create functions in the first place. All right, I know what they are now, but why do I even need to use them? So the first example I love, which is at this point, I believe you probably, and if you haven't, you'll soon decide to create some shapes. You'll move the sprite around, and you'll have it pen down and do something. So the first block, first set of blocks, what that does is it says pen down, repeat four times, move, I believe the number is 25, turn 90. Okay? Do that four times and then pen up. What that does is it moves the sprite like this. It draws a 25-sided square. Beautiful. The block below it does the same thing, but it does a 100-sided square. And the block below that does the same thing again, but size 375 square. And something feels wrong if you have three of these guys sitting in your code. You might say, why do I have three things? Why did I write down three different recipes for fruit milkshakes? One had to do raspberries, one had to do cherry, one had to do strawberries. It's the same recipe, it's just I've changed one line. So you think realistically, let me hearken back to the lecture on abstraction where I said, I should use generalization and try to extract a common pattern to have a single piece of code. So the goal is, can we do that? And the answer is yeah. What we do is we say, that should be really one piece of code. And that piece of code should be a block that you can write that says, draw a square of side length. And that length is an input. And just like the 500 hats of Bartholomew McCubbins, you can grab that input and keep dragging it into other parameters, other pieces of your code that need it. So that's the kind of a thing you can drag with. It's a really cool idea that how we use it in our graphical language snap. So you drag that length into the one piece that was changing across the draw square block, and now you move length steps. And now you have a beautiful piece of code that works seamlessly for any square size you want. Not just the three you had before, but any square size. You've generalized it in a beautiful way. That's why you use functions. In addition, it is how we allow for the generalization of code in general. It's the building blocks of our program. These functions can be composed together, as I show on this beautiful piece of code there, which is I'm going to try to write an expression to compute how much older, how many years older I am than you. And I might be younger than you or older than you. So here's the beautiful thing, and this is going to connect back with our domain and range. Somehow me and you are a variable that stores something, something about you. It might even store your age, your height, your weight, all that information. But there's a block that takes in a person and outputs their birthday. And again, the format for that birthday could be anything. It could be, you know, 2014-09-25, or it could be January 17th, to, or it could be the words of that, J-A-N, right? It could be anything. On the 30th day, it could be any writing it is. But the key thing is that output of birthday is passed into the block birthday to days since 1900. So whatever format that was, the next block better work with that format. If the format is this beautiful old English text, the birthdays to days since 1900 better be the same thing. And so that now outputs, for both me and you, are days old since 1900, the number of days we've been alive since 1900. That's pretty cool. Now we assume we're not comparing dates that are before 1900, OK? And now I subtract those. That's now wrapped in the subtract block. Now we have the difference of days between your birthday and my birthday. That's awesome. That then is passed to the absolute block, which says, well, I don't care whether you're older than me or I'm older than you. This is the difference. Isn't that cool? And now to figure out how many years it is between these two points, we divide that by 365. Isn't that awesome? So you could get the follow result, 3.5 years. And that's just amazing that this um, huge conv convoluted thing does all the work of taking your birth date and my date, birth date and figuring out how much older one of us is than the other. Isn't that beautiful? The difference in ages. So the idea of taking a big problem like we've just done, you know, how do you figure out how many years older difference there are between two people, and coming up with an expression that is a composed set of functions is called functional decomposition. I'm going to break into these five different problems. And I might have had to write all of those blocks. As you see, the divide block, the absolute block, the subtract block, they came with it. But the other two blocks, birthday and birthday to number of days since 1900, were not part of the system. You had to write them. So some of these blocks you'll learn how to write. But it's really cool that putting them all together makes this beautiful expression that makes it all work. Then another reason to use functions is if you happen to live in a world that has, if only the inputs change, 
if the inputs don't change, the output stays the same, that's what we talked about what functions did, then if you wanted to apply a function, let's say to a million da uh, data items, let's say you wanted to calculate the tax, the income tax, on a million people, okay? So you had each person was a list of the person and all their data was in that list entry, and you had a million of these guys. And for each one you say, for that person's and all their financial information, how much tax do they owe? That's a big computation. It might take a long time for you to figure out the exemptions and blah, blah, blah. But wouldn't it be amazing if you could pass that million list onto a million different machines, and each machine was tasked with only doing that one person? Well, each machine cranked away, cranked away, cranked away, and had an output. Here's another example. Pixar has to render a movie. Well, each pixel doesn't affect the neighbors. So you could actually give a machine the job of figuring out what the value of color is for one pixel. And it loads in the whole data set, the whole geometry, the light conditions, and it says, okay, crank, 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 using my realistic renderer, and figure out what the color is for that pixel. It doesn't affect the other guys. So because the comp both computations are massively parallel and don't affect their neighbors, you can pass them off to all these machines. They each work independent of their neighbors, and when they come back, whether this guy comes back first or this guy comes back second, sometimes the computation is harder because they had more exemptions for one person or the geometry was harder in one corner of the screen. It doesn't matter what order they come back in. They'll eventually come back in and fill that out. And that allows us to have massively parallel work done. This is called cloud computing. We'll learn about it more in the class, but this is a really powerful idea that you could have a problem, spread it out to all these machines, have them all come back seamlessly. And functional languages let you do that because they're not a function of state. It doesn't matter who got done first. You're not changing the state at all. And so this is why functional programming leads to really wonderful applications in the parallel space in cloud computing. Finally, I'm gonna give you a quick preview of recursion. When you're defining a function, if you use the definition itself in the function, that's called recursion. You get these amazingly powerful results by just that idea that as I'm building the function, remember you saw me build draw square, if I'm pulling in the blocks to build it, if one of the blocks in draw square is draw square itself. Whoa, that's recursion. We're gonna see a lot more later in the course. Thank you so much, folks.